Welcome everybody for Girl Talk because this is our third episode. Before we go any further and before I introduce my guest, I would like to introduce two very special people. They're our Barbie cameos. You might be able to see them behind me on the wall there. A little bit higher on that shot. <laughs> and they're a donation from the first, or it might have been the second season of Ruby Lounge. And very, very pleased to have them as part of our Girl Talk set down to business. Of course, in this first half of my program, we talk to people who are uh, part of the community, but maybe some of some of the unsung heroes and people that we need to get to know. So on that note, I would like to introduce you to Brian Price. Brian, welcome to Girl Talk. I'm okay. Brian, you work at the Alfred Hospital as part of the, uh, the HIV and AIDS services. Yep. Okay, so can, can we just talk a little bit about that to start with? Yep. You're the coordinator. What, yeah. what does that mean? As, as many people will know, the services at um, Fairfield Hospital closed in 1996, and the Alfred was a successful tender for those services. So the services from Fairfield and the Alfred Hospital were amalgamated to become the Victorian uh, statewide HIV AIDS service. And that's, there's two main wards at the hospital. One's an acute ward, um, and the other one's a continuing care unit, which has services for people who are in end stage of HIV and AIDS, in terminal care, um, people who are needing respite care, okay. and also people who are having step-down care where they're um, not quite ready to come, to go home from their acute episode in the hospital. Yeah, because yeah. I guess the nature of the of the of HIV and AIDS is that it kind of like goes in fits and starts, for want of better words. Yeah, yeah. We see a lot of people who have a lot of um, admissions to hospital, so they'll come in um, for a little while and then go back home, and then they might be in um, a couple of times after that. Mm -hmm. So it, it's making sure that um, we're linked in with those community supports so that we make the transition back to home and back into hospital um, as, as easy as possible for those patients. Okay, yeah. great. How many uh, beds are there? Yeah. On the acute ward, there's 34 beds, mm -hmm. and uh, at the moment, there's probably only about, at most, 15 or so of those um, which are used by HIV and AIDS patients, and that fluctuates on a, on a daily basis. Right. And there's also the continuing care unit, and the figures in, in, the, in that ward were a lot less um, at the start of the year, but they're starting to pick up, and, and that's about eight or so patients. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, and you're the coordinator, yep. so you're kind of like one of the big weeds. <laughs> no, no. Um, yeah, my, my role uh, is about working with the two directors of the unit to, to assist in coordinating and developing the service. And a large part of my role is linking with the community groups that work in HIV and AIDS and making sure that they know about the hospital services and that patients know about the hospital services so that they can link right. in where appropriate. And a big part of my role also is, is listening to things that people, concerns that people have to say about the service as well, so getting feedback. Yeah, yeah just on that note, because we were just talking before we started uh, the whole Fairfield thing, mm -hmm. and obviously it was a little bit con controversial mm -hmm. when Fairfield closed, mm -hmm. and then Alfred, the Alfred Holmes Hospital took up a lot of that, of that, of the slag. Yep. So, um, now that you're saying that's under review now. Yeah, yeah. Um, when, when the services at Fairfield closed, uh, there was a lot of grief and loss in the community um, because of that. Um, and there was a lot of work that needed to be done by the Alfred Hospital. The Alfred had had a small unit uh, for HIV patients um, before Fairfield closed, but suddenly there were large demands on the Alfred Hospital for, for these services. They had to develop um, facilities, they had to improve and expand their services, and they had to learn how to work with community groups as well, which was quite new for the Alfred Hospital. Mm -hmm. Um, so what actually happened when Fairfield closed was there was meant to be a review 12 months post the closure just to see that the services and the quality of service were still there. Unfortunately that didn't happen 12 months on and it's at the moment. Oh, okay. Right, okay. So that'll happen over the next couple of months and, and they're talking to a lot of community um, groups and a lot of patients and also a lot of staff from the hospital. Okay. Because mm. the idea is to give the best possible service to yeah, people. Yeah, and make sure we're going in the right direction for the future. Um, 
What about, what are some of the, specifically, what are some of the, the healthcare needs of, I mean, I know it's in different, obviously in different stages, yeah. but is there kind of like, can you sort of? Yeah, there's, there's different needs. There's acute service needs for people who are quite ill and they need a lot of medical care and that happens within the hospital. There's services for people who are um, finding more people who've got cognitive problems such as dementia so they're not able, they're not as orientated to where they are and they need um, assistance throughout the whole day so they're staying in a continuing care unit or they need extra supports to right. stay at home. Okay. Um, and there's also a lot of supports that are needed in the community as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm so pleased that you told me, <laughs> build us in on the cognitive thing because I was going to ask. <laughs> um, with the, uh, can we, uh, I'm just interested in your background because mm -hmm. I've automatically assumed that it's quite a stressful area to work in, is it? Um, it, it is a stressful area, yeah. There's a lot of demands in terms of um, making sure that the hospital um, hears what the patients are saying and can respond appropriately to those and making sure that the patients can find their way within the hospital but also uh, making sure the hospital is listening to what the community groups are saying around HIV and AIDS. Right. Yeah. Is that something new, this kind of linking in um, the community groups? I just wonder no, whether that's kick-started by AIDS. Yeah, oh certainly within, within the hospital. Um, the coordinator position has, has been at the Alfred for quite a number of years and that's come out of, of really the need to be able to link with those groups who are quite active and uh, around HIV and AIDS. Sure. Yeah. They're all very informed. <laughs> <laughs> well, and what, what's your background? You did a bit, of, a bit of a stint at the VAC, you were saying? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I've been in the position at the Alfred for seven months now. Um, before that, I've, I've spent a lot of time working at the VAC as a volunteer in their support program, so doing that hands-on care. Um, and before that, I was working as a speech pathologist, so that's my, my background as a speech therapist. Okay. So I was particularly working with people who had strokes and things like that. Okay. Yeah. And can, we, can you talk a little bit about, because I think that you, you probably have uh, quite a, um, a good perspective of the progression of HIV mm -hmm. and AIDS, and it's been, what, 12 years now, or something like that? Yeah, a bit longer. So yeah. a bit longer than that. Can you talk a little bit about how, uh, how you've sort of seen the, the progression of the yeah. virus? It, it's changed quite a lot recently with, with the introduction of, of combination therapy, so new um, drugs which are helping people to stay well for longer. Mm -hmm. And what that's meaning is there's a need for the change in, in care. So there's less people dying from HIV and AIDS, but there's people living longer, so the impacts of things such as poverty is, is a lot more, and there's also people who are having um, different side effects from the treatments and the issues of those. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know why I write down this question, because I automatically assume that the health establishment of the big bad is obviously they're not, <laughs> but I just um, wondered whether you've noticed any kind of change in attitudes with the, with the, the, the bureaucracies, the health mm -hmm. bureaucracies. Mm -hmm. Certainly there's, there's changes um, happening uh, at, a, at a state and commonwealth level. Um, hepatitis C is, is becoming um, involved in the HIV funding as well and, and is um, impinging on, on the funding levels for HIV and AIDS. So he hep C actually um, is fairly fatal for people that are HIV, is that right? HIV positive? Is that um, right? There's a number of people with, with HIV and AIDS who are also co-infected with hepatitis C and, and there's a lot of issues around certain treatments and, and the impacts that they have on, on the hepatitis C treatment as well. Right. Um, where does the policy stand today? Are they giving us lots of money? <laughs> It's so um, class. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to be. You know, but, you part, know. part of that is is around the review, um, and we're we're looking at, at what the review sets out in terms of um, implications for for service delivery in the future. Mm. Okay, and then so from the uh, the next question, obviously, is from your perspective, where where do we need where does the service need to be improved? Do, do you see mm. room for improvement? Yeah, certainly in. Um, what we're working on is, is we get a lot of feedback from patients and we're always making sure that we try and listen and respond to those needs. Um, one of the issues that has been coming up a lot for patients at the hospital is around the food services and the hospital has responded to that by... Is that like um, Meals on Wheels it type thing? The food that they get. Well, oh, right, the what they get when they're in the hospital. <laughs> yeah, so there's been changes in that area and um, that was a big issue for patients. but. 
In terms of... Um, why, why is that? Is that because it's sort of the nutritional thing? Like, you know, you know, if you're very ill, obviously nutrition is more important than if you're just yeah. there for a couple of weeks. And Certainly for these patients, for patients with HIV and AIDS, nutrition is an important issue because um, traditionally in the past there's been a lot of people who've lost weight because of their illness and have needed to maintain their energy intake. Mm -hmm. But also, um, with the population, people with HIV and AIDS are a lot younger than the traditional hospital um, people who are staying in hospital. So they're used to going out and eating out and, and having good quality food. Part of the cafe society. So, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> yeah. coming into hospital and having a standard meal that's served to 400 people. It's I just wondered how you kind of maintain some kind of personal balance um, given the rigours of your job. And yeah. So I'm mm. presuming that the that people actually die in yep. right, during their stay in hospital. Okay, yep. so yeah, certainly um, the service is, is works very well together in, in that respect, and, and there are people there that are available to debrief with um, different members of the team. But there's also people out right in the community as well who have a lot of input with um, certain patients and and are going through the same sorts of things. So. People use each other um, for supports and things like that within the unit, but within the community as well. Yeah. Mm. So do you ever sort of phone up your buddies down at the VAC and say, <laughs> oh, a little bit <laughs> Yeah, often um, it's it's people within the hospital that you use to debrief with or people on the ward. It's quite a formal like process, debriefing. Yeah, um, you can go through that process, yeah, of, of having some support if you've been quite involved with somebody and it's had a big impact on you. So. Okay. Brian, thank you very, very much for coming in. And we're all a little bit more of the wise with mm -hmm. HIV and AIDS services at the Alfred Hospital. So stay tuned. Of course, we have our regular health segment coming up next with Dr. Nick and lots of other goodies too. Welcome back everybody and this is a yet another medical segment with Dr. Nick. Welcome again to Girl Talk, Dr. Thanks, Nick. Kate. Now be sure to look out for the continuity in these segments, but down to business. <laughs> today it's all today it's all about STDs or sexually transmitted diseases. What are some of the biggies that people some of our viewers may have heard of? Um gonorrhea, I think it'd probably be the biggest one. Uh, biggest STD, other than the ones that people, uh, uh, other than HIV, hepatitis A, hepatitis B, there's right. gonorrhea and chlamydia would probably be the two biggest uh, STDs. Chlamydia, really? Yeah. Uh -huh. Because these actually go in waves, don't they, in terms of infectious rates, is that right? Are yeah, they occur in, in epidemics that people sort of, they tend to spread through the community that um, go up and down the infection rates, yeah. Okay, so now gonorrhea is actually referred to as dribbly dick, isn't yes, it? Yes, exactly right. So, Pussy penis also. <laughs> What's that one? Pussy penis ah. also. L last repetition <laughs> of the P word there. It's very poetic, <laughs> yes, statement, yes. isn't it? So, and now, that obviously means that there's a little bit of excretion from the penis. Yeah. So, uh, how is that, that's, that's how people will know if they have gonorrhea? Well, if, 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 if people are going to develop symptoms, they'll get like a, sometimes like a milky, creamy discharge from the tip of the penis. It comes too, 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 too much, yes. And some burning and stinging when you pass urine. That's if it's in the penis, but it also can be caught in the throat and also in the anal canal. So okay. And this is se oh, sexually transmitted through what, how do we, do we need to know? Just about any sort of direct contact, really. It can be oral sex, even sort of direct rubbing of people's genitals. It really? doesn't need to be sort of unprotected anal sex or anything like that. It really can be really basic sort of contact can spread it uh, between people. And I think sometimes people don't realise that, that they're thinking about safe sex. So they're thinking, well, it was just oral sex, it was safe sex. But that term safe sex in that setting is usually referring to HIV. Oral sex is a perfectly good way of transmitting hep um, gonorrhea or chlamydia. Okay, so uh, can we can treat gonorrhea? Is yeah. How easy is that well, to get rid of? Well, the first thing is to diagnose it, I suppose. Okay. If somebody develops symptoms, they'll go along to their doctor, swabs taken, a urine test usually, and then the treatment can be given on the spot often. Okay, now what do we do with this? I've got a few props here. The well, swab people, or the healthy? People, I, I noticed that people are really scared about getting swabbed. They've heard, you know... They sort of should be too, no. Schoolboys school sort of frighten each other with terrible stories about umbrellas and spikes and things like that. But it's in fact a really basic, uh, a really basic test. So I brought a swab along. Okay. It looks very long, but basically this little tiny cotton wool bud is put just into the tip of the penis like that. How far does it have to go in? Just that far? Oh, about a centimetre, something like that. 
So uh, safe to say that it's a little bit uncomfortable, but it's yeah, not unbearable. Exactly right. Okay, so it doesn't go all the way down. No, exactly right. In the old days, for to test for chlamydia, it used to have to go in three, four, five, or six centimetres, but that's not that's completely out these days. Okay. So it's not it's not a hell of a lot of fun, but it's uh, it's not too bad either. You know, this is just this this little graphic is just like a Renaissance painting. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it just like Leonardo yeah. da Vinci's paintings? Because he was quite anatomical, wasn't he? In yes, we like to Botticelli to do anatomical drawings for us. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. I'm very impressed. <laughs> so now that's with the that's with gonorrhea. What are some of the other ones we can? Oh, I'm astounded by chlamydia. I had no idea that that was such a there's similar sorts of infections actually. They, they're both bacteria, they can infect the lining of the urethra there, they can cause an anal infection or a throat infection. Right. Um, the main thing about those two is it's really important to diagnose them because they can be treated with a single dose of an antibiotic. One or two tablets, it's absolutely completely gone. So that's why we're really keen on people getting diagnosed uh, for those conditions. Okay, so people just need to look at it. There's a bit uncomfortable, if there's a bit uncomfortable urinating, then they can go just go along and see you. The other thing is that people can actually carry those without symptoms so it's a good idea every now and again to go and see your doctor and ask them to do uh, to do a set of swabs something like that just to see if you're carrying these infections really as a regular thing yeah I think it's a regular sexual health checkup you know a couple of times a year something like that it's a, okay. really, a really good idea it's so better to be safe than sorry Absolutely. really isn't it so now, uh, there's some other, just in the last minute, because of course, we, I wanted to look at it, hep, hep, hep C. Yeah. Not very much time. We've got it's something that people ask you a lot about, but um, Hep C is basically transmitted by blood. So it's mainly injecting right. is the main risk that people uh, have from hepatitis C. So clean needles and syringes, safe injecting practices, uh, absolutely sterile equipment every time is the important thing for prevention of hepatitis C. Okay, and so once again, it's if if you suspect, you should see your doctor, consult. <laughs> yeah, all the all the AIDS council, all the Hep C council have all got information about hepatitis C and how to avoid getting it. Okay, and we should say, Dr. Nick, that you're actually from the from the PLWHA. It's called the clinic. The centre clinic. The That's centre right. clinic in Ackland Street. That brings us to the end of another one. Isn't it exciting? They'd never know that they're taped all at the same time, <laughs> would they? Thank no, you. Yes. See you next time. What are we looking at next time? Erectile <laughs> dysfunction can oh, be the way. This campaign was originally developed by AFAO, which is um, the Australian Federation of AIDS Organisations, um, of which the Victorian AIDS Council, like AIDS Councils in every state, are members. It will be implemented in all states. Um, similar to the way it's being done in Victoria. So it is truly a national campaign, it's not just Melbourne based, although um, we do give it a certain local flavour by adding particular um, resources or um, activities that we think will enhance its, um, its visibility in the state and its effectiveness. relationships were decided on as a focus for this campaign is because research has revealed that um, decisions around sex are, are, are very much influenced by the context in which that sex takes place and um, one of the key um, issues there is whether you're in a relationship or not and that's the other thing as well I mean relationship is a very broad um, concept I suppose and I guess nowhere has that been more challenged than within the gay community. A, a relationship can be many different things to many different people. Um, people can have a number of different relationships at the one time. Uh, so in some ways this campaign is also to, um, to get people to talk about what relationships are and um, how they negotiate relationships, um, those kind of things. key elements of the campaign is looking at um, HIV status, so that positive or negative, and how that influences negotiation around relationships. Um, so um, it's looking at three, I guess, different kinds of relationships. The first is um, relationships where both um, 
partners are HIV positive, the second one where they're both HIV negative, and the third group where there's one of each. The visible products of the campaign are the, the booklets, primarily, which, of which there are two. There's um, one called HIV positive gay sex, which um, is targeting primarily positive gay men. There's a second one called Talking, Testing, Testing, Trusting that um, is um, dealing with a lot of the issues for HIV negative gay men in relationships with other negative gay men. And that um, deals with things like negotiated safety, which is um, for gay men who in relationships where both partners are negative, thinking about um, uh, having sex without using condoms and the steps uh, they need to take if they're going to pursue that path. And that booklet actually assists gay men who in relationships where both partners are negative to actually go through a series of steps um, starting from the point of whether not using condoms is actually important enough to them to go through these these procedures. Um, it's, it's controversial in many ways, I suppose, because it actually is seen in some quarters as a thin end of the wedge. And, um, creating a discourse around unprotected sex is, is, um, is seen as dangerous in some quarters. Yeah, yeah, yeah.